I love it. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're in the actual end of this sermon series called Devoted. And I just, I just pray that um, if you haven't been to church for a while or you've been kind of um, jaded or disillusioned by church, um, I pray that this would be a refreshment for you. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distrib distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. These are God's words. Let's pray. God, I just, I just thank you for this morning. I just thank you for this church. And Lord, there will um, be bigger con uh, congregations than ours. Um, there will be better preachers than me. But we thank you that there will never be a greater gospel than the one that you've given us through your son, that it transforms communities, that it gives life to those that are weary. So bless this word. I pray that it would speak into lives today. In your name, amen. amen. All right, so um, we have been in um, a series, and, and, and really quickly, um, especially if you were in here last week, I was I realized that I think our live stream didn't work last week or something happened and everybody's like, what's the big announcement? What's the big announcement? And uh, this is why we believe in embodiment at Everwell Church. If you come here, you find out things. Sometimes live stream gets a little dicey. Um, so just, just to let you know, uh, we are going to be, we, we found a new church uh, uh, gathering place. I wouldn't say church home because the church is the body of Christ, but we have a new gathering place that we're going to be gathering around um, uh, at Mariners Elementary School. Um, any, any claps for that? Where you got a new place? Yeah? Um, we got a new place. It's going to be amazing. We have um, the classrooms are getting renovated right now. Um, we have a huge space, um, which is a whole bunch more than you know, we have. So we have a, a good place for us to grow in. We have, uh, like, it's going to have like outdoor, outdoor playgrounds, too. One for smaller kids, one for bigger kids. So we're going to wear out your kids. So by the time you get them after church, they're ready for their nap. Um, it's going to be an amazing, amazing thing, and it's only three miles away from this place right here. So it's east side Costa Mesa, almost on the edge of Newport. So it's Irvine and 17th. So our soft launch into that building is going to be August 11th, but our main one's going to be September 9th. So um, if, if God is calling you to, to be a little bit more um, uh, committed and, and, and intentional about calling Everwell Church your home, we would invite you to get signed up in the back and come, come, come build this thing with us. God is doing so many amazing things, and you're, you know, we're about to hit our terrific twos um, as a church, so come, come with us. All right, so here we go. So we're going through a sermon series called Devoted, how the early followers of Jesus were devoted to their Savior and to four practices. Now, here's the really crazy thing, just to, to bring you up to speed. So um, I don't know if you know this, but um, and, uh, there, there was an emperor named Emperor Constantine. He was the one that kind of took Rome and, and told Rome, like, we are going to get rid of all of the pagan uh, religions. 325 AD, Constantine saw a, uh, a cloud or a figure of a cross in the sky, and over it there was words that said, in this sign you will conquer. So there he, he, therefore he was about to go fight all these people that were trying to take, overtake Rome. So he said to all of them, I want you to put a cross on each shield. Um, the first time we see Christian branding outside of the fish on the back of a car. And he's, you know, he says, put it on there, and they end up going to war, they end up winning. Um, I don't know if that's how God works, but that's what happened. And so what ends up happening is he takes, um, and he says that Christianity is going to become the main religion of the Holy Roman Empire. The whole Roman Empire, an empire that ruled for a thousand years, and this empire was persecuting the church relentlessly, relentlessly persecuting persecuting the church. It actually shows us that um, uh, 
uh, Emperor Constantine actually had all of the bishops and all of the pastors, all of the persecuted church that had been in hiding for 325 years persecuted. And as he looked at the sea of people that was out there, there were people missing limbs, people that were burnt alive, people that were missing eyeballs because they would not bend the knee to Caesar because they only had one Lord and that was Jesus Christ. This devotion of our early church fathers and mothers is just astounding. People that were devoted. I mean, just that, that, that a whole empire was brought to its knees because they believed that a rabbi in first century Palestine rose again from the dead. And because of that, their sins were forgiven and they could live lives that were generous and good. So in this sermon series, we've been looking at the early church and what made them Teflon strong. What made them completely unbreakable. Though their outward body was perishing, their inward body, their inward soul was being renewed day by day. So, um, so what were the four practices? Well, we were looking at it. One was the apostles' doctrine. That it wasn't just um, how they helped and served the poor, but it was actually what they believed. That the way of life, that they had, a, they, they had a way of teaching that was looking from the Old Testament to the New of who Jesus is, that he was the Messiah, and through every single picture of the Old Testament, every single principle of the historical or the wisdom literatures, that they were all summed up in Jesus Christ. And the apostles' doctrine was preaching and saying, it's nothing more than Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That it was only Jesus. And so, in Acts 2.42, we see that it was apostles' doctrine. It was the fellowship, koinonia, this fellowship that we have, this family fellowship, breaking of bread, which was communion, and prayer, that these four practices were the things that they put their lives into. Now, here's the deal. A lot of you believe that church is based upon preference and opinions. And many of us, we have a millions and millions of different denominations, but the early church was not built on preference, and it wasn't built on opinion. It was built on practices. And those four practices were just getting into the Word of God, it was being committed and devoted to each other. And it says that in Acts 2.42, that they devoted themselves. That there was no coercion from their wives or their husbands. Oh, you better get in the Word, or you better be praying, or you... Hey, hey, you need to go to community group because you've not been hanging out. You've been antisocial, right? No, it, what does it say? It says that they devoted themselves. I love this. The first time that we see this community language also personifying as individuals, as individuals. So today I want to talk about, we, we already went through the four practices, so you guys are going to have to download the app and listen to it later. That's my one little um, uh, ask for you guys to do, download the app, Don't, uh, uh, listen to it later. But I want to talk about the implications and good and positive consequences from these four practices. What type of people are produced that are devoted to these practices? And what type of community is created? So what are the implications for our church and the church in general? What are the consequences? Is the church just a place we talk about the Bible? Is it where we just gather together? Is it where we just talk about and only remember the Lord's sacrifice for our sins? Or where we will say that we will pray for others? Or are we people of consequence? Are we people of consequence? Have you ever heard of that, that, that phrase before, being a person of consequence? It's like, you know, like, you know, no one messes around with Jim, like Jim Croce, you know what I mean? Like, like you know, like a person of consequence says what he means and means what he says. Says what she means and means what she says. A person of consequence doesn't just have word as breath, but, but words that are connected to action. And so what we see with the early church is they did not just talk the talk, like the Pharisees who were beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they had, they were, they were unwashed, they were like tombs, they, they were just filled with death, that they were so good at manipulating and getting it. And here's the problem with Orange County, and I'm sorry, and some of you guys aren't from Orange County, you're like, give it to him, Josh, give it to him. Um, this is the, one of the problems with Orange County is, is we focus so much on the outside 
that, that if, if, if there was a question or if there was an idol or if there was a God that we serve um, in Orange County is, what do you look like? You don't have to be holy, but do you look it? You, you, you don't actually have to be rich, but do you look it? You know, you don't actually have to be smart, but do you use those $7 words? You know, moralistic therapeutic deism. Like, like what are the things that you try to disguise yourself around to do? And so I, 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 just, I just ask you, like, do, do you feel that? Do you see that around you? You're like, yeah, I see it all around me. It's not me. So I'm, I'm legit. I'm too legit to quit. Like, I am the real deal. Some of you guys got that. Some of you guys just went, it's OK. That's why I'm praying for you right now as I'm, <laughs> oh gosh, this is going to be a good day. Um, but, um, but as you were making appointments or not cutting class or completing your daily tasks, people begin to notice. Your words become valuable. Your words become your bond. You become a person of consequence. When you say something, there is a related outcome. You realize that your life isn't enough for you anymore. You want more to live by, more to achieve. You start assessing your life differently. I mean, this was something that was huge for me. I, I prayed this over Wellen. I, I, I want well, and just as I want my own son to be a man of consequence and integrity, that he is truly who he is when no one else is around. And sadly, in this culture, we have, been, we have, we have become just cultivated to, to play these cultural hiding games. We, we have these respectable sins. I deal with pride, not, you know, lust. You know, I, I, you know we, 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 we do these things and we say, you know, I've been gossiping a little bit. But you really deal with anxiety. And we do these things that are a little bit nicer. Respectable sins, I like to call them. And we, we forget of being truly real. And um, Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, uh, Seven Highly Effective Habits of Successful People. Did anybody read that? Raise your hand if you ever read that. Oh, some of you guys have read that. Some of you are like, nope. Um, I read it so I could see who the successful people, like what kind of habits they have. I didn't, it didn't help me at all. But like, it, you know, it says the successful people, they'll have these habits. Um, I read it in high school. But he said this really, really interesting thing. And before you get all weird about it, OK, I know that he was Mormon. But he had something really good to say. He said this, while we are free, he wasn't a Mormon theologian, by the way. I have to do that. He was just like a business guy. Okay. While we are free to choose our actions, we are not free to choose the consequences of our actions. I'll say that again. While we are free to choose our actions, we are not free to choose the consequences of our actions. And this is the interesting thing about devoting yourself to the word of God, devoting yourselves to koinonia, devoting yourselves to communion, and devoting yourselves to prayer, is you can actually choose those things. Be a part of those things. Wrap your life around those things. See beautiful and good consequences that come from those things. See, when I say the word consequence, I use that a little bit in jest because sometimes we only think of consequences being good. Lola um, is my daughter. She's three and a half years old. We just got her. What did we just get her? We just got her a toy. Oh, we got this like little like, uh, like uh, uh, race car kind of toy. She wanted this race car toy that she got. And the reason why she was able to get this toy was because she got stars on her sticker chart. When Lola is good, you know, and basically when I say she's good, or Shay says she's being good, we, she goes, I get a sticker on my sticker chart. And like, honestly, like, it's like for anything. Like, she does like one thing, I'm like, it's good enough. Let's do this. Let's like just the joy on her face and the joy in her heart. I'm just like, I will give you a million stickers on a sticker chart. Anyways, she gets good and beneficial consequences from doing well. But when she doesn't do well, she doesn't get the sticker on the sticker chart. And it's a really interesting thing because she's constantly realizing that when she doesn't do things, the consequences change, and they're not always good. But sometimes consequences are positive. So what are the implications for the church? And what is the unintended consequences that we cannot see for us? Um, there was this 
Um, so three things. One, supernatural. Two, practical. Three, sacrificial. Those are the three points that we're going to look at. What are the supernatural um, implications and unintended consequences? Um, secondly, practical. Um, and then thirdly, sacrificial. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, um, verse 42 again, and uh, verse 43. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then it says this. I love this. Look what it says. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through apostles. Some of you here today are like, okay, he's going to get the snakes out. Uh. Not going to get the snakes out. Don't you worry, okay? Um, <laughs> and I'm not going to. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go uh, and get all wooey wooey on you. But I love what it says right here. That after they do these practices. And awe came upon every soul. Okay, the spirit falls down. People are speaking in tongues like crazy. Um, um, there, you know, uh, Peter preaches out and teaches um, the people of what's happening. This is from the prophet Joel. This is the very beginning of the church, and that's great. People come to know the Lord, but then they start talking about what the practices were. And though people were amazed and awed by the Holy Spirit falling down and the miraculous happened. What I would love for us to see is that the four very ordinary practices of reading the Bible, of getting together, of, of doing communion, of prayer. I love this. It says, and awe came upon every soul. When's the last time you've read the word? When's the last time you were in a prayer meeting? When was the last time were you allowed or you were expecting the good consequence of God actually showing up in your life? So, sometimes we, we're actually kind of like, we, we feel like if we don't believe that God speaks to us, he won't. So we'll stay around and we'll go to these prayer meetings and we're just like hoping that no one prays and gets a little too close to home and talking about me. And so what we do is we put up all of these guards, whether it's through theology or through prayer or being like, I don't really believe in that prayer, that way that that person's praying right now. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Right? Like we, we, there, there's, these, there's these things that happen and what I love about God is God does not care about what you think about him. He's going to do it whether you believe in it or not. He is going to invade into the world. And supernatural, we always kind of get scared. We think of ghost hunters or whatever when we think of the supernatural. But I would like us to think of the supernatural being something that we haven't discovered yet by the scientific method of what we can actually observe. But when it comes, it's unmistakable that it's something other earthly. It's something completely different. I love this. And awe came upon every soul. And I would say that that word would most describe wonder. The supernatural has invaded the natural. Or should I say the kingdom of God invaded the broken world we inhabit. I want us to think about how natural, um, uh, how natural as a concept that we think of, so that's natural, how, how much that is relative and just based on time. Think about this with me. Think about this with me. There was one time that it was natural to die of measles. It was a natural thing that someone got measles. All right, well, you know, let's get the, let's get the dirt, you know, start getting, you know, the grave starting to get because this person's done. You know, it was, uh, it was natural for someone to die of dysentery. Right? It was a natural thing based upon and relative to time. It's natural. We laugh at that now, right? What, what else was natural? It was natural that once you would get sick with scurvy and die. That was a natural thing. But then it was discovered that limes and citrus would cure you. Just some Sprite, whatever little bit of fruit they have left in that soda. You'd be good. You'd be great. Some of you guys are like, that's not Josh. You need to go to Trader Joe's. OK. <laughs> but for some reason, based upon time and relative, something that was natural, you would just die of natural causes, something alien, something unknown, invaded into your natural, and you were healed. And then what became natural? Health. Cure, 
flourishing life. So we are in a world broken by sin. We are so in bondage to our addiction, we think that our addiction is freedom, whatever sin is, and it's really abduction that has brought onto you the Stockholm Syndrome to where you have fallen in love with your captor and you think that the sin that you have been in, the life that you have right now, is, 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 is the one that you have chose and the freedom that you have in your life. And I'm telling you right now, Jesus says, absolutely not. Your self-centeredness is the root of all of the problems that have you in this world against your family, against your friends, against your workplace. And the supernatural message of Jesus starts to invade the natural world. Would you agree that the, that the world is not the way it's supposed to be? I mean, this is something that I think is incredible because I think believers and the unconvinced people that don't believe in God will both say whatever aisle they are on politically, the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Why not? Why not? If we were, if we are just the product and the good consequences of a completely naturalistic world to where there was tons of natural selection and all these different kinds of things that brought us to this place, things are exactly the way that they should be. And you can't tell me otherwise. You say, Josh, humans have rights. Why? Why? Can you see a human right? Can you observe it with your scientific microscope? Why do you have human rights? I know this is a little bit like, like big and this is a philosophical thing, so I'll come back down. But like, but like really, like honestly, I want to push that a little bit because so many people think that, w especially within the Christian or the supernatural or the spiritual community, they love like just kind of trying to be these juggernauts being like, you believe in Harry Potter and you believe in just all this silliness. And the truth of the matter is, is you're telling me that the world's not the way it's supposed to be. However, you believe in a system to where everything is through random natural selection and you're still telling me the way this is the way that it's supposed to be? No. You're living in a cognitive dissonance. You're living in a world of saying one thing but living another. I refuse to believe that logic. I mean, there are so many things for a Christian community. I just wish the Christian community would just stand up for itself for one moment saying, I believe what I believe, and they are believing what they choose to believe. See, there's consequences in everything that you do of Formation or deformation. The things that you do will deform you or the things that you do will form you or reform you or do something well. And it is up to you. And in the supernatural world to where we believe that God, Jesus Christ in the flesh, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus was sent into the world to say, the world is not the way it's supposed to be and I am its cure. Are you, are you guys getting this with me? Are you tracking with me? Because here's the deal. Until you see that love came down to be the cure of things not supposed to be this way, you will never experience on your heart. Oh, I long that for you guys. I long that for you guys. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You've been in worship experiences. You've heard the scripture. You've, you, you've realized for a moment, you're like, man, old Josh wouldn't have done that. Man, like old Josh would have just thought and stuck to himself, but, but this new Josh, because of what Jesus has done, is, is transforming me. It's, it's starting things that I don't want started, and it's stopping things that I don't want stopped. All came upon every soul. And that's what I love, too. It was, it was distributed equally. It wasn't just to one person, but all came on every soul. I mean, this morning... Um, uh, or yesterday and this morning, my daughter's just been preaching the Bible to me. Uh. Like, she's just been straight up wanting to bring me the Bible. This morning, she's like, she's like I, she brings her Jesus story Bible to me, and she goes, um, she goes, Daddy, Daddy, the Bible. And I said, what, what should I preach on today? And she told me Adam and Eve, and I said, that's perfect. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. But she's constantly wanting to talk to me. She was doing this with her hands yesterday. Jesus, the cross. And I'm like, if you want to go to seminary, I'll put you through it. Um, no, but, you know, it's just been so brilliant and amazing. And I refuse to believe 
that every time she gives me a kiss or any time she says, I love you, Daddy, or when she says, Daddy, you proud of me? I refuse to believe that we're just random particles and chemicals bouncing against each other. I just refuse to believe it. And you can do it, and you can just be completely disillusioned and feel super, you know, hip and, and disillusioned by the way things are and just trying to tell everybody that Santa Claus isn't real. But guess what? The deepest part of you believes that there's more to life than what we think. And what we see as natural is only temporary. It's only temporary. It's fleeting. It's a moment. Who would have thought that I could FaceTime somebody right now all the way across the world? Who would have thought that? I mean, some of you guys have been like, man, I wish I could just see your face. How many conversations for people that used to long distance date been like, been like, oh man, I could just wish to see your face. And now we won't even do that with our grandma. We're like, oh, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to get ready for that. But like, how true is that? It's a wild thing to think about. G.K. Chesterton, my, my patron saint, said this, all science, even the divine science, is a sublime detective story. Only it is not set to detect why a man is dead. Okay? It's not, this, 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 this world to be curious is not to talk about why a man is dead or why things are not the su- way they're supposed to be. It says this, but the darker secret of why is he alive? Oh my gosh. Okay, do you guys get this? So this is like big. G.K. Chesterton, this guy almost 100 years ago is talking about this. I want you guys to know this about, like, like th- that idea, why is there something rather than nothing, is like one of the biggest arguments of human existence and the reason for God. Why is there something rather than nothing? And we're constantly trying to figure out the death and the brokenness in the world and the darker secret, the beautiful secret, the thing that science is still wondering is, why are we alive? Why are we alive? See, this is not emotionalism. This is awe. Awe of what the miraculous is, the supernatural life. What do we see here? And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. See, we think that we're living in a, uh, in a space that we shouldn't be talking about supernatural things, even though every blockbuster film, and I don't even know, do people even say blockbuster anymore? I feel like that was only when blockbuster video was out there, but I know what a blockbuster is, okay? Older people, you're like, blockbuster is actually this. I understand that too. But Every blockbuster film is about the supernatural from Harry Potter to every Marvel comics. How many is there? There's more Marvel comics than like Land Before Times, right? Like you remember Land Before Times had like 30 you could get at Costco for your kids? You know what I mean? Like there's so much of the supernatural that we're surrounded by. And why is that? Why is that? Those supernatural movies we say aren't real while they're making more money than we could ever see in our lives. See, for example, one of the things that has been attacked was the Narnia stories. It, was, um, it, it happens to be uh, when Susan, um, there were four children in the Narnia series, uh, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And at the end of seven books, Susan doesn't get to go to heaven, spoiler, with the rest. Um, she loses out on salvation, at least temporarily. The reason given in the seventh book uh, uh, really has freaked out and upset many other critics. For example, Charles McGrath in the New York Times Magazine once once wrote um, that there's the unfortunate business with Susan, the second oldest of the Pavenzies, who near the end of the last volume is denied salvation merely because the text tells us she's interesting and nothing nowadays except nylons, lipsticks, and invitations. She um, She always was a jolly sight to keen on being grown up. McGrath goes on critiquing um, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who wrote Chronicles of Narnia, says something like this. In other words, Susan is denied salvation simply because she criticized the Chronicles, uh, or, or, or simply because she has reached puberty. In other words, she became sexual. Critic Philip, Philip Pullman, by the way, is having a new TV show um, on uh, HBO, which he wrote the Golden Compass uh, Chronicles. He's trying to be like the anti-dark matter... Uh, 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 C.S. Lewis, which joined the line, everybody has tried. Um, critic Philip Pullman, who also criticized the Chronicles of Narnia, says this shows C- 
uh, shows that C.S. Lewis, first of all, didn't like women in general, which was ridiculous because he married somebody that was an embattered woman who had a child that he took as his own. So, like, easy, Philip Pullman. I'm just, I'm protective of Lewis and Tolkien, okay? Um, um, that he didn't like women in general. Secondly, he didn't like sex at all. The idea that Susan, when she grows up and likes nylons and lipsticks and invitations, that's because she has reached puberty and she becomes sexual, she misses salvation, means obviously C.S. Lewis is a misogynist and a Puritan. You know what? That's completely missing the point. Lewis is, make, uh, uh, is trying to make with Susan because it is also says in the book, Susan isn't a friend of Narnia anymore. That is the place um, uh, the, the, the world uh, that she grew up in uh, 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 make believe because she just laughs at the kids and says fancy you still play those stories in your head that we played as children C.S. Lewis believes Susan made the mistake he made for many many years that many people in our western society makes that is we believe that to grow up you can't believe in the supernatural anymore to stop being a child you can't believe in the supernatural for example, when you're a child, you read fairy tales, and they enthrall you and fill your heart with wonder. Do you know why? It's because the fairy tales, um, uh, the fairy tales tell us this physical world is not all that there is, that there's a supernatural world beyond it, and there are supernatural forces of good and supernatural forces of evil, and we can be a part of the drama. There are other worlds where people fly or people live forever or people rule and reign and everyone wears a crown. And there are worlds that sometimes you can get into. Sometimes forces and being from there can come here. You can be a part of all that. Isn't that exciting? That, that in our society, at some point, we say to children, it's time to grow up. It's time to put away childish things. Here's what we tell children in our society. Hey, there is no supernatural. This world is all that there is. You're here by an accident. You're just a random product of natural selection and survival of the fittest. And when you die, you're just going to rot. There's no supernatural good, supernatural evil, because good and evil are just social constructs. They're just relative, and nobody really knows who to say what is good. If you still believe in God and you still believe in the devil and the demons and the angels, you are a child. You're intellectually primitive, and it's time to put away childish things. You believe this, even if you're a Christian, at some level you believe this. That's a case like a place in Orange County. So much of the Western society still, we tell ch children, you can't grow up unless you stop believing in the supernatural. In other words, in our society, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to believe the Lord of the universe from the another, uh, uh, from, uh, the Lord of the universe from another world broke into this world and was born in a manger and defeated the powers of evil and death and rose and triumphed over the grave, that the supernatural world and the community that is a part of that you can't believe in it. See, this is the thing that I, I want us to kind of get at. The reason why I'm telling you all this, and the reason why you're like, man, why is Josh telling me about these crazy supernatural things or stories? What, why am I doing it? Because at some level, we need to be reminded that we live in a world that is not just based on what we think is as ordinary, but extraordinary. Brendan Manning says this, that the spirituality of wonder knows the world is charged with grace. That while sin and war, disease and death are terribly real, God's loving presence and power in our midst are even more real. So what do we see? What are the implications? What are the implications? The implications are this. That amazement seizes them and they glorify God and they are filled with Ah, oh, why? Because the implication for a church that practices the way of Jesus is not awe at the miracle, but awe of the one that made the miracle possible. Not what you can do with a miracle. Okay, let's sell this thing. Let's get a Kickstarter and make this, this miracle really work. But it's actually what it means that God is renewing the world and he is starting with you. See, the four practices of reading the Bible, getting together, koinonia, communion, and prayer, those four practices are supposed to speak into the supernatural world. See, this is the thing. The love that the church is supposed to embody, this agape love that we took from the Greeks and we made it our own because they weren't really using it, 
This agape wor word is supernatural. How am I supposed to love my enemies? How am I supposed to do good to those that hate me? How am I supposed to love my brother who throws me into slavery? I get out and I have a time, like Joseph had a time and he was able to do something about it. But he says, what you intended for evil, your bad consequence, God turned that bad consequence into a positive one. I've turned it for good. It is a supernatural teaching. It is a supernatural community. It is supernatural to forgive, right? It's supernatural. In verse 12, um, uh, uh, or excuse me, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, If I speak with tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, I love um, the ESV too, prophetic powers, it sounds pretty hip. Cool. And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have love, I have nothing. So the supernatural is the agape love. That is supernatural. Secondly, we see a practical community. So it's not, superna it's not emotional, it's supernatural. It's not, it's not ideological, it's practical. What do we see? We see in Acts 2, um, uh, 44, and it says, And all who believed together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all that had need. I want, I, want to, I want to move here. What is he talking about here? It sounds a lot like communism. Is Jesus a commie? You know, us Americans, we furl when we hear about love being generously given. There is no such thing as a free lunch, right? Well, I want, I want to say something. Three things, just practically. Practically speaking, what does this community do? What are the good implications for us as a community? What are the good consequences for us as a community? Well, one, that we can actually be community, that they didn't see themselves of different classes, that though there were classes back then, that some were richer. I think right now, of who was the seller of purple? Lydia, Lydia right? Lydia, she was this person that owned a couple properties, um, and she was doing really, really well for herself, and uh, she, was, she invited Paul to be able to stay with her. And then right after that, Paul casts out a, a demon out of this one girl, and she's in poverty. She was a slave. And they were part of the very first church. Completely opposite people on different kinds of the spectrum, but brought together because of the agape love of Jesus. That community was brought together. But in this early church community, when they were all coming in into Jerusalem, because this is how um, Acts kind of forms. It goes from Acts uh, it goes from Jerusalem, everybody in the church here is in their hometown, and then it goes into Judea and Samaria, which is outside of Jerusalem, of the insiders, and then it goes to the rest of the world. That's kind of how the narrative is, is, is set up. But this community is the people that are close, and they said that they had things in, in common. One, what do we see? We see community. Secondly, we see generosity. People are selling stuff to give to others. People are finding out that there's debts in, um, in the community, and they're saying, oh, I, I can help you with that debt. But I want us to see this practically, that there is insane, an insane amount of generosity before there is transparency. It says that to everyone that was in need. I would rather give a few bucks to someone than to tell people how much debt I'm in. I'm not, I'm saying it, I'm not in debt, don't worry about that, but <laughs> you people are like, Josh, are you okay? No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. But, but it's like almost kind of like the American way Right? Like, I'd rather give five bucks to somebody that's less off than me than ever tell anybody how I overdrafted, how I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen. Do you feel that tension, or is it just, just me? Especially in Orange County, so affluent, right? Like, we're, we're, we have everything so together. You're wearing the nice shoes, and you're wearing the new trends, and you don't want to tell anybody how much credit debt you're in because you still have it all together before there was transparency the church made it very very easy for people in the community saying hey if you ever have a problem you come to me I know that there is incredibly generous people that are in this congregation that have been 
overly generous with other people in our congregation. Not just monetarily, but with their time. With their time. And it's just, it's fantastic to me. And I think that we need to do more, not to brag about our wealth or brag about our huge opportunity of, of, of time to be with people, but we need to do it in ways and make it known with people that, hey, you can let down your guard with me because I'm going to be there for you. What do you think about that? Because I would say that this is not communism. I would say this is a... What, what I would say that the early church was functioning in is they were in this economic mode of communalism, which is basically what? It was, it, it was basically a generosity based on love, not compulsion, not the state telling us what to do. Rome could care less what the Christians were doing with their money as long as they got their taxes to keep on their campaigns. The Christian church wasn't rallying around and saying, we need to take down the Romans and then make them distribute everything that was in their coffins. Right? Like, no. That, that wasn't what was happening. It was through their wealth. I, you know, we always talk about Ananias and Sapphira as the example. Oh, man, those people, you know, gave their money, but they took back a little bit of it. You know what happened right before that was Barnabas. Barnabas, this man, his name is a son of encouragement. And what he does is he sells some land and he takes and sells the land and he takes all the money and he lays it at the disciples' feet. He says, I have been freely paid of the most damning debt that I ever had, which was my sin. And because of that, I'm free just to give. And not only was he free to give his money, but you know what else he gave? His time. Why? Because then he started becoming a missionary. And then when Paul or he was first Saul, but then Paul, Saul, who was a persecutor of the church, he wrote a third of the New Testament. None of the big old, you know, disciples, you know, burly, you know, Peter and John the mystic, none of them wanted to hang out with Paul because they were like, he might be a sleeper agent. He might kill us in our sleep. I don't, want, I don't know if he really is a believer. I don't know if he's a real brother. Barnabas is like, what else do I have to lose? I just sold everything, all my securities. I sold it. I'm following after Jesus. I'll go with Paul. I don't care. What's he going to do to me? He can't rob me. He can't do anything to me. And then Paul gets into like a, you know, an argument with John Mark. And, and Barnabas goes, Paul, I'll go with John Mark. You keep on going. I'll go. This guy is a son of encouragement. Why? Because practically, he was a person that was practically generous, not only with his money, but also with his time. See, one of the reasons why God wants you to be generous is because he wants you to practice the good response and the good consequence of having your eternal debt lifted. When you realize that the greatest debt, the reason why you work so hard and you try to make so much money is, is because it comes from one thing, approval and security. That, that, that I'm okay. But when you realize that you have all the approval that Jesus Christ has given you because he has died for you, the ultimate death, and that you have all the security because what can take you from his love? Death? The sword? Persecution? Height? Death? Nothing can take you from this. So practically, you can practice generosity because Jesus has been generous with you. Lastly, the last point. It was a practical community. And then lastly, we see it was a sacrificial community, not egotistical. Sacrificial in its face is one that is wanting the best for others. One of my favorite definitions of love is by this Puritan writer, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was probably one of the greatest minds America has ever known. And he said this. He said, love is finding happiness in another person's happiness. Love is sacrificing your own happiness because you want the other to be happy. Some of you guys have children. I think of well and up here and seeing Mikey and Mackenzie and, and just being able to dedicate him. The, you're all here today who have come around. Some of you guys have flown from out of state to be here to show the love and devotion you have towards Wellen. Why? Because you want to put your happiness in their happiness. Oh, yeah, it's not that big of a deal coming to California, some of you. 
It's not that big of a deal I have to listen to a long sermon by a mustached pastor. But you're putting your happiness into another person's happiness. Sacrificial, not egotistical. All of this world, this world is constantly telling you, your phones and Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, your phones are designed to make you feel the center of the earth. That every notification that you get is saying, here you go, here you go, here you go. That it's your feed, that you're the center of it all, and you have started to believe that, and you didn't really even need an iPhone to tell you that you felt like you were the center of the world. This community is sacrificial, and it says this in verse 46, and day by day attending temple together. Hey, let's just be Christian, but let's not just, let's not go to church together. <laughs> like, I don't want to sit by you. Like, 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 you sit over there in the, the weird seats over there with them, and I'll sit over there with my friends over here. It says they went to the temple together. They were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. What does that mean? They got food, and they broke it, and they gave it. In verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. Usually... Christians love to praise God and not being favorable with other people. We like saying, you know what? Don't judge me. Or like, you're a heathen and you're out there and you're those kind of people and you're going to hell in a handbasket and I'm here with my Christian friends and I'm praising God over here. The early church wasn't like that. They praised God and they found grace and favor in the eyes of other people. That they lived lives so sacrificially and so loving that they were a joy to be around. Almost a joy that made them feel like wool was on them. They're like, why, well, this guy's kind of weird. Why does he keep on being nice to me? Why does this girl keep on inviting me over for food? Why does she keep on baking me things? She didn't stop that. <laughs> day after day breaking bread in their homes, and they received it with generous hearts and praising God. You know what the one really cool consequence of a practice, of these four practices, is one thing that the enemy, Satan, can't counterfeit. He, he can counterfeit happiness. He can counterfeit good feelings. That's why we have drugs. There's so many things that the enemy can counterfeit. The one thing that he can't counterfeit is praise of God. The one thing that the world cannot give is praise to God, which is the complete posture of the ways things are supposed to be. In the garden, we were made in, in a love relationship with community. Um, there was food, but there was no gluttony. There was drinks, but no drunkenness. There was sex, but there was no affairs. There was no divorce. There was no brokenness. It was perfect. Food would come in, it would bubble up into worship. Drinks would come in, it would bubble up to worship. Relationships would come in, it would bubble up in worship. And then sin came in and broke that to where everything became about myself. Right? Everything became about myself. Oh, wretched man who I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Right now you might be saying, oh my gosh, what am I doing? How am I feeling? This is not, this is not right. This is not good. Josh, I don't, I don't like this, this feeling. Okay, what do I have to do to sacrifice so that God would love me? That God would actually let me into this community? The only qualification to be a part of this community is to be incredibly unqualified. The only qualification to be a part of the community of Jesus is to be incredibly unqualified. Who's unqualified? I am, right? <laughs> so here's the deal. The consequence that we deserve for a life lived for ourselves was not put upon me, but Jesus Christ on the cross. That the unintended consequence for my self-centeredness, for my life of, of going against God's good design for our life, of going against the way things are not supposed to be, the way things that were supposed to be, that food would come in and it would bubble up into praise of God, drinks, praise to God, relationships, praise to God, promotion, praise to God. It became all about us. But Jesus Christ that day was divided on the cross, broken apart, 
so that you and I could be put together again that we could be unified, that we could be there. Great God of wonders, all thy ways are matchless, godlike and divine, but the fair glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled shine. Who is pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Have you said it? Are you praising God today, the God from whom all blessing flows? Are you praising him that he loved you so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross for you, that Christ rose again to justify you, and that he is now interceding on your behalf? Do you believe it? Do you know it? If you do, you must praise him. C.S. Lewis says, it costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things. But to convert rebellious wills cost him crucifixion and everything. What What has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Let's pray. Lord, we we thank you for this time. Bless um, this worship. Bless the communion. Bless the tithes and offerings that are given. I pray for those here today um, that, that, they, that they've realized that they've been living for themselves, they've been living in communities, or they've been outside of communities, and they haven't felt worthy to be a part of a community. But Jesus has called them worthy, and he has called them to a supernatural, practical, and sacrificial community that has good consequences, not only for their families, but for them as individuals. And if you're here today, and you just want to invite Jesus into your life, and to be invited into the family of God, if you're here today, and you have felt the good news, realized in your heart today and you long for you desire it would you raise your hand and i'll pray for you right now god bless you and you and you and you i just want to pray for you right now god i just pray for those that say it they don't have to write a huge theological work they don't have to do more things right now where they are they can say god i want to follow you all the days of my life. I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for you. Lord, bless this time of worship in your name.